Hello and welcome to Dope is Death, post-film conversation. This conversation is a special program of CIFS Streams and Anna Fields Wolf Book Awards as part of Cleveland Book Week presented by the Cleveland Foundation. My name is Eric Seiler, Professor of Film, Media and Communication at Cleveland State University. And I'll be the moderator for this conversation. We are pleased to be joined by two people from the film. First, we have Mia Donovan. She is the director of Dope is Death. And we also have one of the participants from the film, Cleo Silvers. She is a former member of the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords. And she's also a healthcare activist. And she will tell you a little bit more about her community involvement. So without um, further ado, let's just get started. So Mia, I'm going to first start with you. Um, powerful, powerful film. You touched on a lot of issues. And uh, can you just tell me what, what inspired you um, to make a film like this back, uh, you know, that took place in the 70s? Here we are 50 years later, and you're telling this story that some people and know about and some people do not know about. Um, yeah, I, um, about, in about 2012, I met Mario Wex's daughter, and he's the acupuncture teacher who taught members of the Black Panthers and the Young Lords acupuncture. Um, and he lives in Montreal. So I met him through his daughter and he, uh, I became really interested in, in the, the fact that these were members of the Black Panthers doing acupuncture and also that the acupuncture is being used to treat heroin addiction along with acupuncture, or sorry, along with political education classes. Um, my, I have a stepbrother who's been in on and off methadone for about 30 years and in and out of drug programs. So I think part of it was my interest in like this non-chemical way to treat addiction. And um, I, I just, I started writing Dr. Matula Shakur around 2012 and started visiting him in 2000 and the end of 2013. And then um, a few years later, decided to really pursue this documentary. Wow, very, now, um, let me understand, when you um, first learned about um, what was going on in New York, you were in Canada, in Montreal, is that correct? Yeah. So, okay, so you, um, and you learned about it, so and then you um, uh, went back and forth to New York and also out west to um, visit Dr. Shakir to start developing the documentary. Yeah, like fortunately I was, at the time I was shooting a different documentary that was taking place mostly in San Diego. So I was going to LA often and Matulu was incarcerated near Los Angeles. So I was, you know, it worked out that I was able to be able, I was able to find, to, to visit him a couple times a year. So um, that's okay. sort of how it started. Interesting. So how did you gain his trust? How did you, you I'm, he doesn't know you and you don't know him. How did you gain his trust and just happen to get access to visit him? I think it's, it started with Mario Wexu, who is in Montreal. Um, and Matulu and different members of the Black Panther, uh, sorry, different members of the Young Lords came from South Bronx to New York, to Montreal in the mid seventies to study here. So when I wrote Matulu, I, the first time I said, um, I told him that I was reaching out to him because of Mario and I wanted to, you know, know more about, uh, you know, their relationship and um, that I was going to LA and I would like to meet him. It just sort of happened and Mario, or Matulu was so happy, I think, to hear a, from somebody related in connection to Mario who he hadn't heard from in a couple decades. 
So it just kind of slowly happened, but not, it wasn't overnight. And also I, um, Matulu put me in touch with his son, Moprim Shakur, who was able to like look at my prior films and kind of assess me in a different, in a different way for his father, which facilitated this also because Matulu couldn't watch my other films or really do any other research on his own about who I was. So interesting. So you just said it didn't take overnight. How long did it take? To um, I mean, it's I, I'll probably three years of, you know, like visiting him, um, really developing this idea for a film and writing treatments and sending them to Matulu and corresponding that way and going to New York and meeting Walter Bosque at first and just, you know, like it's these ideas take a while to gener to generate and to like to see if, if there is a possibility that people would be open to me or that, you know, that it's that there is material there, you know, so that's, that's just how it, it seems long now, but in retrospect, it was just part of what I was, you know, I was doing other things and it was just sort of happening. So it doesn't seem like it was that long, but looking back, it does, it was a long journey, but that's how it is. <laughs> well, well, yeah, exactly. It seems like it was a natural um, part of your life in which you were, you know, constantly working on it and in between other projects and then it took off. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm also, I'm just so fortunate, very, I feel very uh, lucky that, you know, Matulu was believed in me and was, he facilitated most of the, the meetings with people. Oh, great. So, great. yeah. And as, as um, you talk more and more to um, uh, various people that you focus in the film, they became more comfortable with you and opened up more and more each time, I, I suspect. Yeah, and everyone, like with Cleo, I was first introduced to Cleo through Yoruba. So it's always somebody I would meet would be like, oh, you should talk to so and so, and they would put me in touch because the story sort of, you know, uh, was building or like uh, taking form that mm -hmm. way because, um, I mean, there's much more information online now because people are more interested and people are talking about it. But even just like today compared to eight years ago, there's so much more information online today than there was when I first started. I, I, I can believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Cleo who is here with us as well too. Um, Cleo, uh, when Mia first approached you, when you first heard that, you know, someone named Mia was going to make a film and wanted to speak about you. What was your initial reaction? Were you open to talking about it, um, about uh, what went on during that time? Well, of course. Um, Mia was like the fifth person to do, to start working on a documentary about this particular um, aspect of the struggle in the South Bronx and the struggle at Lincoln Hospital and the, the struggle to uh, build a drug detoxification program in a community where there was none, essentially. And that's what the situation was. One in four people in the South Bronx were addicted to heroin. And the only thing that was available to them was a um, methadone maintenance program. So. It's, it's, it's exactly. And as um, Mia put that in the film, the methadone um, soon was replaced by acupuncture. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that and what your feeling was about using some uh, an alternative medicine to help deal with um, the heroin, her heroin crisis? Yes, during that period, um, everything that was alternative was, was cool with all of us. We were young, uh, we were excited about life, excited about making change in a society, and every new idea seemed like something very important and something that we should approach and, and attempt to make the kinds of changes that were necessary in the community and in the in the healthcare uh, delivery department so we were we were pretty excited about the the whole concept of using acupuncture as opposed to 
the old tried and true methodology uh, in drug rehabilitation. So that, that's good that you were open to that. Now at the time, um, you were um, part of the Black Panther Party. Um, can you speak a little bit about the Black Panther Party? Um, Black Panther um, Party has um, many connotations to various people, but um, as displayed in the film, they were a tremendous asset in helping um, people. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. The Black Panther Party has a reputation that has that uh, we received from the government, essentially from the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, as uh, being a um, kind of a racist, anti-white organization. But in fact, uh, the Black Panther Party worked with all kinds of people very broadly. We were coalition builders. Um, the focus of our work was to help people in the community and to end police brutality. That was a major focus. Um, and that was one of the reasons why the organization was established in the first place was to end police brutality or to stand up to uh, police brutality as it existed at that time. And um, we found that in order to get support from the people in the community, we had to do other things. And we began to recognize we had a 10 point platform and program, which included quality free health care for people um, and end to um, the use of um, violence as a way of uh, controlling the community, involvement in the community, quality housing, um, and of course, quality health care. And a part of, and and in Harlem and the South Bronx, healthcare issue was like at the top of the list of what needed to be done, as well as um, free free breakfast programs and other projects that we did, free clothing, that kind of thing. So people see us as uh, um, violent and having guns, but the major uh, things that we use, the, the major materials that we use were our books and our ability to help people in the community. And that's how we gain the support of the community. Very good. I appreciate you shedding light on that aspect of the Black Panthers. Um, uh, backing up a little bit, um, can you just give us a really brief overview of your life and how you actually became involved with the Black Panther Party? Well, I started out as a VISTA volunteer, Volunteers in Service to America. Um, the uh, OEO, which was a, an agency in the um, poverty programs in um, the 60s, in the late 60s. And Volunteers in Service to America was a um, uh, domestic peace corps sort of thing. And so I was uh, sent to the South Bronx as a VISTA volunteer, I was the first African-American woman VISTA volunteer. Uh, and I got involved in working on housing and all the horrible conditions, environmental uh, justice. And uh, the, there was only one hospital for 180,000 people. And uh, not only did I start working on the the quality of health care that was being delivered to people in the community, individual families in the community. But I got a job working in the hospital. And then the workers, the other workers that I met that also in, got me involved in the labor union, 1199 SEIU, also introduced me to the Black Panther Party. Uh, and the Black Panther's office was next door to the dojo where I was taking karate lessons. So it was pretty, pretty simple that we all kind of mixed, got mixed up together. The Black Panther Party supported the struggles of the workers, the, the labor uh, union and the workers uh, at Lincoln Hospital. And our demands were things like um, just not having a 72 hour wait in the, in the emergency room. Uh, having a program for drug rehabilitation, uh, decent, uh, a decent approach to uh, qu the quality of the care that was being delivered so that nobody died on the uh, surgery table because we're having a lot of deaths from the community. 72 hour wait in the emergency room. Did I say that before? That was a really big one. Um, 
and, and no triage. No, mm. it was a, the Puerto Rican community was 60% of the South Bronx at that time, and there was no translation. There were no, uh, no one was hired to translate so that the communication between the doctors and the patients was almost non-existent. So mm. with all those conditions, I mean, it was pretty, pretty easy for me to get involved with struggling with the other workers and, and fighting for quality health care. Yeah, exactly. That's really um, great that you saw a need in the community and you um, decided to act upon that. Um, you know, as you know, there are many bystanders and, you know, that um, just say it's someone else's problem. So, um, yeah. good. so um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more, but um, back and forth, feel free to um, chime in if you want to. Um, as um, Mia some questions as well too. Now this film, um, Mia, um, how, um, what type of film do you, did you see this as? I know this is like an evolving type of film. Did you see it as like a historical piece, like a, a, a race film, a gender film? Uh, what type of film did you see this or do you see it differently every day? Um, well, all of those, I think it's more like I didn't want to make necessarily a bio documentary. I wanted it to represent the movement and, um, you know, like the, the issues that everybody was describing to me, like the motivation um, that behind, uh, you know, why the, the kind of what led, what made acupuncture such an appealing political tool, like both politically and for, for self de towards self-determination. I just thought like the fact that everyone was so young, like Matulu was 20 in 1970. I think Cleo was about the same or? Yeah, I was about the same age as Matulu. And just like every time I spoke to somebody, just like they're, it was they, just the hope and ins they were just so inspiring. And I was just, couldn't imagine myself at 20 taking over a hospital and coming up with such a, um, an incredible s solution to a health issue. So I think I was trying to contextualize it, trying to understand why acupuncture, how it was effective and how it was political. Um, and I think it's, I mean, it started out as a whole, as an entirely different, as one idea. The original idea was, Matulu was originally supposed to be released in 2016. So I was anticipating filming him when he got out and kind of um, a little bit more of a cinema verite documentary with history. And then he did not get released. So um, I think that's what really and I had already been in touch with people. So it sort of like became more historical, but also the history is still very present. So I wanted to, um, I'm not sure if I'm rambling too much, but it, I, I think more of like a, a film about a movement than- right. um, it, it, Exactly. And that would have, if, if he was released, that would have changed the whole narrative structure. Totally. Exactly. And I know that, um, uh, it was indicated that he did not um, do an on-camera interview with you. Um, mm -hmm. He just uh, wanted you to take um, notes on your conversation and not be a part of it. Well, actually, he, we we weren't given permission. We we weren't allowed to film an interview with him. Uh, all our requests were denied oh. by the Bureau of Prison. And as far as I know, he hasn't been allowed to give a videotaped or phone recorded interview since 2003. And it's not just me, I've spoken to other people from, that have been in touch with his family, like they're, the Bureau of Prisons doesn't have to grant an interview to an individual in prison. You know, so it's, it's up to the warden and unfortunately, we tried so hard and um, luckily, we were able to, with the, you know, the people who have interviewed him in, in the past were shared their interview, their interviews with us, so. Do you know if, if Matulu has seen the film? 
No, he hasn't seen the film, but I sent he because we and another thing I can't send him a copy of the film. So I we sent him a transcript and tried to do our best to describe what the archives looked like. And so he read it and um, he's very happy with it, but hopefully we'll get to show it to him. Oh, yeah, ho ho hopefully. I mean, it's yeah. yeah ho hopefully, I'm, I'm glad that you said he was happy with it. What about others, um, participants, subjects in the film and also the general view, viewing audience? How has this film been received? Well, um, we were able to have one great uh, live screening just before the pandemic at True False Film Festival in Columbia, Missouri. And um, we were joined by Mo Prem Shakur, who's Dr. Matula Shakur's son and Juan Cortez from the film. And um, so it was, it was really amazing. I, it was a really great experience. It was great to have his son there who, and Juan there. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really emotional. And like people, a lot of people wrote Matulu after. And sure. then, Matulu is now at, in Lexington, Kentucky. So we, we were able to visit him right after the screening to fill him in. And then, um, you know, as me and Cleo were supposed to meet in Cleveland a few weeks after that and that, so everything's changed. But I do know that Matulu has been getting a lot of letters, correspondences and um, from the film, which is great. And um, we were, you know, particularly what's great is that um, the National Acupuncture Detox Association, NADA, has recognized him, his contribution to this history and are already like changing, um, making plans to, like, to, to change their educational programs at some acupuncture schools. And so he's getting a, a cemented kind of place in that history, which is really great. Well, wonderful, wonderful, Amazing. wonderful. So I'm sure uh, once this pandemic ends, you're going to even get more knowledge out of this film. Uh, let's jump back over to Cleo. And um, Cleo, um, with this, and one thing that you said in this film was that um, you said you wanted, you demanded free and quality health care for all. And um, I know um, at the hospital wasn't um, doing that. And it just seems that just the information that came out of the film, knowing how long people waited and the conditions that hospital were operate, was operating in, uh, did that seem, how, how did that seem at the time? Did that seem out of the, out of the ordinary or was that kind of like customary in the South Bronx? I mean, take us back to that era because I can't wrap my head around it. I'm sure a lot of people in this day and age can't wrap their head around it. Well, free quality health care is still a slogan and is still a call um, for everyone across the United States. Uh, having free quality preventive health care is really what the call was for us. And that every human being deserves to have a uh, high quality of health, health care delivery uh, just in order to uh, to receive life, liberty, and the, uh, and the pursuit of happiness, because you can't have life if you don't have health. And we felt that everybody should have like quality health care. But because the horrendous conditions in the South Bronx really called for just decent health care uh, for the people of the South Bronx, the people of Harlem, hospital care was not very good. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the uh, things that we called for, like uh, the ability to see your chart, the ability to be treated like a human being. Uh, that was a, a question for as many um, healthcare facilities as there, as there are in the United States, uh, and particularly if you're a person of color, because of the quality of healthcare that was delivered to people of color was totally different and that that was delivered to the majority of the society. So. Exactly, that, that sounds. And it still is. <laughs> right, there, there are issues still going on like that today and in healthcare, um, equal, I mean, uh, equality and, and healthcare. And um, as you um, 
you know, you're someone as the young people say, you're someone that has history. <laughs> Literally, you have a lot of history. And, um, and if you can shine some of that history on people watching this about how do you think um, things have changed in terms of healthcare to today? I know there's still struggle. Do you think that um, any advancements have been made and, and a film like this can help advance it? What do you think about that? Well, certainly there have been advancements, but one of the major issues is the preventive uh, aspect of it. Being able to prevent diseases that are preventable, like tuberculosis, like even the, the um, uh, cor coronavirus, which was actually a preventable disease, uh, like anemia, like asthma. These are preventable, like diabetes. These are preventable diseases. And if the, there was a focus in the healthcare community on going door to door and meeting people or, or having a, a place where people could come to deal with um, diseases that were preventable, the conditions for health in, you know, throughout the society would be a lot better. So that's one of the focuses that, that we wanted to uh, implement in the society was for people to uh, be able to, to know if they were, uh, if, if there was a, a possibility that they could uh, get rid of a disease that, that, that was, or not, or not have, or not gain a disease that was possible with preventive, um, with preventive medicine. And there is not a preventive medicine focus in healthcare at all right now. So um, things have changed considerably. Um, there is a um, Patients' Bill of Rights, which we wrote <laughs> in the process, in this process where there are rights that patients have now, but the preventive uh, part of it, we don't, we haven't been able to, uh, we haven't been able to get that going yet. It, 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 it's, um, I understand what you're, you're saying. There's, um, uh, you know, prevention is the key and education is the key to that as well Absolutely. too. And on, and on speaking about education, what would you say to someone that was your age during your time, um, you know, being active in the Black Panther Party and the um, Young Lords? What would you say to someone now who's, I guess, late teens, early 20s, um, that's looking to, I guess, get involved and to make a change? What would you say in this day and age? What would you say to them? What advice would you give them to do now to, if they really want to make a change? other than the traditional um, phrase, go out and vote. What else? Well, uh, try to organize. Uh, also, try to understand uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a group setting, uh, in an organized way, what's going on in the society. And make, um, make an advance on understanding what the conditions are and what you can do. What, what things can you do to change the conditions in the society today? There's still uh, so many things that need to be done. And I, and I think that we can demonstrate against um, uh, police brutality, police murders, but in, until we're able to make the connection between the conditions that people are faced with, those are financial conditions, economic, political, and social conditions, um, unless we know what those things are and have a plan for how to project our, ourselves into, into the struggle to alleviate those kinds of problems, um, I, I, I think just demonstrating is, is not going to be very effective. It's not going to be terribly effective. That we really do need to uh, see what our even our own families, even within your own family, what are the conditions? What are the things that you want to change? Exactly. Yeah, instance, exactly. Basically, having um, a basic uh, $15, uh, $15 an hour salary and as a minimum wage. You know, that, that's pretty basic, but those are things that a person should be thinking about fighting for and struggling together to obtain today. 
Okay, wow. so very, very good points. And I'm sure people uh, watch this, hopefully they will um, um, heed those points and you know, act upon them. Uh, I'm gonna go back over to uh, Mia uh, now. And um, with this, um, with this uh, film in terms of, um, I guess, developing it, I mean, all filmmakers have some type of um, like, um, um, artistic inspiration, whether it's through books, through other films, through other filmmakers. Can you speak a little bit about your artistic um, inspiration and maybe not just this film, but just in, as your career as a filmmaker? Um, I, it's, um, I mean, I watch a lot of documentaries. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I feel this is hard to answer, even though it's because uh, no, I have so many in so many different ways of drawing inspiration. But for this film in particular, I was really um, inspired by the Last Poets um, music, and I think a lot of like I always, um, I mean, New York City has. Uh, I always have these. I saw this documentary when I was probably 12 called 80 Blocks from Tiffany's that takes place in the yeah. South Bronx. Did you ever see it? For some reason, it always stuck with me. It's about the South Bronx gang. So there was like, um, it's hard to say. I think I, I really did draw a lot of inspiration from the archives, the texture of the archives, the, the, the last poets, those, the first two albums really, I listened to them all the time while I was um, researching this film and luckily was able to get a few of the songs for and, and to meet uh, Jalal for, for the film. But um, in terms of like filmmakers that I'm inspired by, I really, um, I love Chantal Ackerman, um, Agnes Vardes, uh, the Maisel brothers. Um, I mean, there's just, so many I'm right exactly and I find like like a lot of inspiration is um is um subtle you know you take yeah. in, you consume a lot of um film and media and it has like this impression upon you and you create from there you know it's almost like you know you're eating or training for something and you know that food is building up you know you know muscle so you know, those films have built up your artistic muscles in that sense, so. But I, I will say that I think I'm mostly inspired by like counter narratives of, the, of subjects that I, or uh, that I don't see, that I just see the counter narrative or more with my last films, um, people who have been like stare, like misrepresented by the media or somehow like, um, you know, like, uh, so the, yeah, there, there, it's more like what I'm, I feel like drawn to provide counter narratives to people in, in subjects that I feel have been misrepresented largely. Okay. If that's, that makes sense. That, that's good. Very, very, very good point. And that leads me to the same question I kind of asked Chloe, but I'm going to put a, uh, a slant on it in terms of what um, um, advice would you give to maybe a young filmmaker, someone that's interested in documentaries per se and um and how they should pursue it and also you know telling the story um well, what advice would you give wow that's go, go ahead um, no no i i was just asking because he said uh um go ahead sorry no no i mean for you me for you Mia, because i asked cleo about advice to young people today being active yes. um this, Oh, because you said, I wasn't sure if you were asking me no. or Cleo, because you asked Cleo the question. I, I asked Cleo, but, no, I asked Cleo yeah. the question about advice to young people being active. Yeah. So I'm asking you about young people going into filmmaking and especially documentaries. Um, I think, I, I mean, I think it's just if you're really inspired by telling a story, you just find a way to do it and um, go to, you know, network a lot with people from festivals and or you know people in the community and um learn from each other and um you it's really hard to do documentaries alone so you really need to um find some good people to collaborate with 
Okay, very, very, very good, very good point. And um, uh, just uh, one more film-related question for filmmakers is, um, I noticed you served as the editor on the film. You actually did the editing or you worked with the editor? Were you the actual editor? Um, yeah, well, it was a very long editing process. Uh, I, like about a year and a half altogether or so. And I did have two different editors who I was able to, I had, I was able to hire for six weeks each at different stages. And, but it just, I couldn't, uh, who, but I, I couldn't, um, so they both brought different things. Like the first editor I worked with worked, uh, was really strong with more like the cinema verite scenes. And then the second editor I worked with was really good at structure. And she really provided a sort of a historical structure that I just, it helped me kind of organize my footage in a, in a way that made sense. And then I, I, I was so nervous to actually edit it because um, I did, wasn't very confident as an editor, but I just had no choice and just pushed through it. And then I had a story editor come in at the end so i it's me but with without these three people i like it would have been very i don't know if i would have been able to do it right okay well good i mean it was, it was, a, it was, it was, it was a nice um collaborative effort and um what what was driving the story because you had a lot of newsreel footage that was just um tremendous the footage that you were able to um acquire and uh, i should that helped drive the story and also the interviews as well. Did you see them competing against each other or were you just strictly relying on the interviews to help drive the story and fill it in with the news bill footage or a little bit of both? Well, originally it was looking just, I wanted to just have, ideally it would have been to just to have some news archives to sort of ex support the, the um, support the interviews, but the, it, because it was, such a historical film and I worked with this great archival producer uh, who was able to 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 really help find all this material um, it just seemed really important even though it's it's very complicated to work with this amount of archives as you probably know uh, just licensing and um, but I the more I started to look at the archives, the more it just felt like it needed it. So um, it, it took on, it, you know, it took on a whole, um, I, I mean, I can't really imagine it without the archives. Exactly, exactly. But it's, it's you know, it's, it's very complicated and it, and it makes the film um, a lot harder to, to finance because it's, it's very, it's very hard to to license these. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, yeah I, I bet. Yeah, and, and costly <laughs> too. All right, I'll jump back over to um, Cleo. Um, what are you doing today? Um, um, are you still active in the South Bronx? Are you have you moved your interests elsewhere? Can you update us on your life now? Sure. Uh, well, I'm in my in my early 70s now. I'm retired. Uh, I've been retired for about five years. Um, I moved from New York uh, to Memphis, Tennessee, which is where my husband is from. Um, and I'm still active. I'm still involved in community organizing. Um, I'm still working with um, young people. Uh, we're still fighting a good fight here in Memphis. We're trying to get rid of uh, Nathan Bedford Forest. That's the last exciting thing that happened here is that we got rid of the uh, statue of Nathan Bedford Forest out of a very prominent position in the city. Um, there's the Civil Rights Museum is here where, you know, Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated here in town. So I'm still an active person. Um, I have not been able to uh, attend any of the demonstrations because um, physically I'm not as, as, I can't be as active as I was, but I'm still, I'm still at it. I'm, it's almost impossible to give up once you um, get yourself immersed in this, in this struggle. 
because it's something that it's, it's all around us all the time. And that's the other thing, Eric, that I just wanted to tell people, young people, please be uh, united in your work. You know, it's very difficult to engage um, in this kind of struggle without a lot of unity. So that's like a really important, um, important point. Yes, as I said, very, very important unity it is. Um, you know, we're in a more isolated times in which people are on social media, and but um, you know, unity is very important. And uh, at the time um, when you were active with the um, Young Lords and the Black Panther Party, there was no social media, but you found a way to unite and be effective. Well, the, uh, young people now have everything. We had nothing. We had a, a mimeograph machine and a little bit of ink. And we got out thousands of flyers and talked to people on the street, sold newspapers, and talked to people on the street some more. And essentially, that's, where, that's what we did. Talk to people and knock on doors and talk to people there and engage with uh, other human beings. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap up on, in a couple of moments, but um, my last question for you, Cleo, is um, uh, this film is obviously going to get a lot more exposure, especially you know, once um, the pandemic ends. And uh, what's the one thing, one takeaway that you want people to um, have from this film? Um, one, the, I think the key, Thing that Mia was trying to get to and, that, and that's a part of, of what it is that I do too is to fight for um, freedom for Matulu. Matulu Shakur actually is, is never engaged in any of the criminal, criminal activities that he's been incarcerated for. Uh, he's incarcerated for uh, some kind of a being the leader of, this, of, of people who were engaged or who were uh, so-called engaged in this struggle. And um, the fact is that now he's he's aging, he's ill. Uh, he should be free. He should be uh, out here with his family as opposed to in prison at this time. So for me, I think that's a pretty important point is that Matulu Shakur should be free. Very, 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 very good point. And that will make a, a part two for me to consider. <laughs> Uh, if he is, you know, that does come about. Okay, Cleo, well, thank you. And, uh, but to still stay on, I'll say some parting words to you. But um, Mia, um, what's next? What's for the future for you? Um, are you working on a project now? And are you still planning to have this film on the um, film festival circuit? Um, well, we're, during the, the, the COVID, the quarantine, me and, um, uh, some colleagues were going through all the material that didn't make it to the film. Uh, so we, we just finished a, a four part podcast that we're going to release very soon, like in a week or two, which is also co called Dope is Death. And it, uh, we interviewed um, Matulu's current lawyer uh, working for on his parole case and for a compassionate release. And we interviewed some other people, but also have uh, uh, material from the documentary. So it's kind of what you were asking earlier when it's like, how do you let go of a film and, you know, you edit it and then, but I, um, coming back from the first film festival and just being, having nothing, you know, just, we were able to, you know, that was one positive thing personally that came out of it. We had all this time to, uh, uh, work together on that and um, I'm um, working on some other projects uh, a first narrative film and um, you know I'm still hoping to you know working hard to help um, spread awareness about Matulu and um, he really had he should be released he's 70 he has he's been diagnosed with cancer. He's not a threat to society. There's no reason why he shouldn't be released after serving 34 years on conspiracy charges where there was actually no physical evidence right. indicating that he was anywhere. And, and, and if he is near released, these crimes. 
And if he is released, would you consider um, interviewing him and, and um, Absolutely. doing some additional editing on this film? Well, maybe not on this film because we'll keep it. But I mean, if he wants to do any, if he wants to do, if he's open to doing something um, that he's directly involved in, I would absolutely want to collaborate with him on um, whatever we can do um, during, you know. So we're, we're all trying to stay positive that he will be able to go back to his family soon and enjoy kind of, um, you, you know, the, the recognition that he's getting from all these acupuncture students and, and he still has a lot of stuff to teach people a lot of, uh, so yeah, we, we have to stay positive and hope that that will happen. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Being positive is the key. Well, this has been a, a wonderful um, conversation um, with the both of you. I appreciate you joining us. And if someone wanted to see this film again, they just saw it and they say, I can't get enough. I have to see more of Chloe and I have to learn more about Mia's work. Where can we watch this film? Well, it's, uh, we're trying to get it out on a broad platform, but I, I just don't know exactly um, what, what that will be yet at this moment, but it, if there's, there's a website, dopeisdeath.com, and the production company is called I Steal Film. So you can go on those sites and hopefully it'll be available on a digital platform this fall. Well, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Um, I'll say goodbye to you in a moment, but Cleo, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very Thank much you for your time, and I wish you the best in your continued work. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, Amir, thank you as well, too. I wish you the best. And uh, I just want to thank our guests and our audience today for joining us for this important conversation. For more information about SIFT Screens and the Annisville Wolf Book Awards, please visit clevelandfilms.org. My name is Eric Seiler. Thank you. <laughs>